Let us stand to worship God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life.
Please join me now in a responsive litany of confession. The Lord is our good shepherd, guiding us and helping us. We judge others, we are lazy, and we follow only our own will. We separate ourselves from the Lord and our honest deeds. We choose to do wrong, even though we know what right is. Lord, hear us as we can. Now take a moment for silent confession. The Declaration of Pardon. The Lord is always there for us when we fall. Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. Nothing we can do can separate us from the love of God. Jesus Christ is our good shepherd. Friends, believe in the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Christ is always there for us. Let us all enjoy and give thanks for the grace of God. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. Christ is always there for us. As members of the household of faith, we can share the good news to all. The peace of Christ be with you. Our first scripture lesson, oh, I almost forgot. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit. As the word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say. Our first scripture lesson today is from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to attend to her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised 
to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and to entreat him for her people. Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone, may that person live. I myself have not been called to come in to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your families and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold the fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. The word of God for the people of God. Our second reading is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, beginning with verse 22. Listen for the word of God. At that time, the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you and you do not believe in me. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I will give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I suspect some of you are wondering why we are diverging from Pastor Neff's Acts of the Apostles sermon series with a sermon on Esther today. Good question. Pastor has kindly let me preach today on Esther so I can fulfill a requirement on my ordination path. See, I've got to preach on the passage of scripture I was tested on in one of my ordination exams. So thank you, Pastor, for letting me do this, and I appreciate it very much. Now, on to Queen Esther. Esther is an odd book. One of the most unusual things about the book of Esther is that it is only one of two books in the Bible that do not explicitly mention God. The other is the Song of Solomon. That fact, along with its lack of other overt religious references, led many people centuries ago to object to the book being in the biblical canon. As scholar Carol Myers writes, quote, for both Jews and Christians, the most prominent reason for its disputed status is its lack of of explicit religiosity, end quote. I can see why people objected. It is strange that a book included in the Bible doesn't mention God. But even though God is not named in Esther, God is still present and at work in the story. We just have to look a little harder to see it. 
it is a reminder for us that sometimes we must look closer to see God at work in the world. Before we go any further, a note about why the Jews were in danger of destruction in Persia, where the story is set. They faced such peril because Mordecai did not bow to Haman, who was the top official in the kingdom just under the king. It made Haman so mad that he wanted to destroy Mordecai and his people, the Jewish people. All right, after that brief interlude, we'll now take a look at Esther the Queen, a complex character with a remarkable story. She's an orphan and is adopted by her cousin Mordecai, who is an official in the king's government. Mordecai advises Esther to hide that she is Jewish so she can be in the running to be queen. Another thing that's unusual about her is that she didn't marry a fellow Jew, which was rare and frowned upon in those days. She's also a hero. Esther shows leadership, courage, and bravery the way others in the Bible have, such as Deborah, David, and Moses. And the story of Esther is also about her transformation. At first in our lesson today, Mordecai is the one giving direction. Mordecai tells Esther to go to the king and beg for mercy for their people. But later in the passage, their relationship has changed and Esther is the one giving orders, telling Mordecai to gather the Jews in Susa and hold the fast for her. The roles have reversed, according to scholar Adele Berlin. Esther has stepped into the role of leader for the Jewish people in Persia. But how did she change so much? What were the forces that led her to change? I think it was a few things. Her people were in trouble. Mordecai tells her that if she doesn't go to the king, her father's family will die. He also tells her that maybe she was made queen for just this moment where she could do something to save her people. Her courage to lead shows God at work in her too. God is inspiring her to a higher calling, giving her the strength to take the risk and ask for a fast and to go see the king. God is here with Esther. We can also see the presence of God and religious action in the story when fasting is discussed. Back then, people thought by fasting that they could influence the divine, according to scholar Mary Joan Wynne Leith. Esther, by ordering a fast, was seeking help from God. Otherwise, I don't think she would have ordered it. Esther had faith and hope that if fasting occurred, it could help their cause before God. Fasting is an intensification of faith, an intensification of pleading and petition in prayer. It is holy. It's an action of sacrifice as part of a plea for rescue. To turn a situation around, it is denying oneself sacrificing the physical sustenance of food to grow spiritually. However, fasting from food is not for everyone and may not be healthy for some. But fortunately for us, there are many other things we can do to fast. We can fast from our smartphones or tablets. We can fast from watching television or we can fast from shopping for things we really don't need, which is certainly something I am guilty of from time to time. The practice of fasting, Esther's plea for fasting, and Esther's courage is evidence of God's presence and hand at work in the book of Esther. 
These days, God's hand in the world is obscured quite a bit. There is relentless stream of news, bad news, and it is understandable why we wonder where God is in the world. One only needs to look at the war in Ukraine to see that and the horrific number of people killed because of the Russian invasion. Innocent people, including children, being killed because of an evil dictator's obsession. Millions of lives upended and changed forever. A country changed forever. But I also invite you to consider that God is at work as well. A spirit of goodness and action have taken hold in countries adjacent to Ukraine. God is alive in the aid agencies that are helping out, including the Presbyterian Mission Agency. Countless acts of charity are being done to help those who are suffering. Even the bickering nations of Europe have unified with the United States in opposing Russia with various sanctions and aid to Ukraine. Dozens of corporations have even stopped shipping products to Russia and halted operations in the country, including semiconductor maker AMD, Netflix, and software company Salesforce, according to the Yale School of Management. When thinking of finding hope in a terrible crisis that is on the news each day, this quote from Fred Rogers is very appropriate. Quote, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping, end quote. To this point, I saw a story on the nightly news on RTE, the national public television channel in Ireland, about a Ukrainian woman in her 80s in poor health, reunited in Ireland with her dog, who she had to leave behind as she fled for safety. Now, I can't think but help but think of all the people who helped get that dog to that woman. It is a reminder to me that even in the darkest times, God makes God's presence known. God is never gone from our midst. God is at work, make no mistake. In Esther, there is much grief and panic as the Jews fear for their lives. But then there is the inspiration of God in Esther to lead the people. There are times when our stories seem secular and do not hint at any transcendence or point toward providence in our lives. I have certainly had these times. But it is then that a deeper understanding of faith is asked of us. It is those times we are called to see God at work when we cannot see God. We can still believe God is at work and trust that God is acting. God is invisible and indivisible. God is here. I believe in the sun and even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I'm not feeling it. I believe in God even when God is silent. I invite everyone in the sanctuary and those viewing online today to seek out God in the everyday in life. Where you see goodness and caring, you see God at work. I see God when I see someone doing something good for someone else. I see God when I experience nature, when I go to Lake Michigan or jog around Washington Park and I see the budding trees and the green grass. There, I see God's handiwork. One of the other places where God is for me is in the courageous people who overcome hardship and boundaries and live for others. God is there with those of us who struggle to keep inspired and share hope with others through what we do. 
I also invite us this week to fast, if we are able, from something we may pay too much attention to or use too much. Maybe it's our phones, the TV, or the news. Finally, I urge us all to not give in to the gloom that life sometimes presents to us and to look for the hand of God in each situation. Because if we look, we will find it, just like we can find it in the book of Esther and in Esther's life. And in Jesus Christ, God has offered us a powerful example as well as the means to spiritual power, our faith and hope. And we can also be grateful that we can turn to God anytime because God is with us always. God is here. Amen. believe and trust in God the Father who made all things. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who redeemed the world? Trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God. We welcome all people, those who are here on this beautiful morning, those who are worshiping with us online. This morning, our congregation celebrates the gifts of women today as we honor all girls and women. And after the service, there is a meal hosted by the men of the church. There's plenty of food. Please join us after the service and happy Mother's Day to all who are celebrating today. 
Uh, this coming Saturday, our men's core group will be meeting for breakfast and Bible study. And then at 11 o'clock, we will host a memorial service for Pat Foley. We remember Pat as being generous of heart, constant in faith, a woman who believed that with God all things are possible. We give thanks for the witness of her life. Next Sunday after the service, we will be having an organizational meeting to plan our booth at the South Loop Farmers Market. This is an incredible opportunity for our congregation to bring awareness to the wonderful sense of community that we experience here at Second Presbyterian Church and we want to share with others. If you can give an afternoon or evening of your time uh, once a month on Thursday, please join us or make us aware that you would like to participate. As Brian said, next th Sunday we'll be returning to our sermon series on the book of Acts. I invite you to read ahead. But for now, I want to give thanks to our seminarian, Brian Lewis. He passed all five of his ordination exams he recently defended his master's thesis. He will graduate in a few weeks from the University of Chicago Divinity School and then will be approved by the Presbytery as a candidate for the ministry of word and sacrament. Brian, would you stand and be recognized by your home congregation? Let us continue our worship as we uplift prayers for ourselves, for our friends and family, prayers for our city, state, nation, and our world to God. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-loving God, we praise you and thank you for giving us the gift of faith and community. We give thanks for the gift of Jesus, who showed us how to live life. He is the Prince of Peace. We need your help, Lord. Hear our prayers before you today. Lord, we pray for peace in the world, and an end to the war in Ukraine. Heal the suffering and brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. We pray for peace in Chicago. We pray that all people can turn from anger and violence and toward peace. We ask, Lord, for an end to the horrible division in our country that respect and reason can rule over our political debates. Finally, we ask you to continue to strengthen our congregation here at Second Presbyterian Church and continue to guide us on your way. And now, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The Lord has given us so many gifts. Let us now offer some of those back to God with our Sunday offering.
great God, we give you thanks for the power that comes through faith. Calling God, you call us to share in the great causes and movements of our time. You give us ideas and inspiration, vision and values to make today better for tomorrow. For all who have gone before us, especially women, for all who have guided and inspired us to live the life of love, we give you thankful praise. As we dedicate these offerings, we ask you to elevate and consecrate us to live out and become what the world needs most. May our offerings of self and substance contribute to your realm of justice and peace, healing and love. Thank you for being here with us this morning and for all the gifts that come from your spirit. And all God's people said, amen. Now, friends, let us go from here out into the world. Let us see God wherever we go and bring the peace of God wherever we go and to all we meet. And may God bless you and keep you forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you.